Now it is time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. According to the Independent Auditor General, this Liberal government will overpay $9.2 billion for renewable energy contracts. It is the same Liberal government that has received $1.3 million in donations from some 30 renewable energy contracts. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier, and I, I'm hoping she can be on the record to answer this. Is there any connection between the reckless renewable contracts for hydro we did not need and donations to her Ontario Liberal Party? Thank you. Premier. No, there's not, Mr. Speaker, and I, um, I would ask the uh, member opposite as he goes on his, uh, his um, gambit on, uh, on clean renewable energy, which we have put in place in this province, a 90 per cent uh, clean electricity grid, Mr. Speaker, if his thought is that we should reopen the coal plants. Yep. Supplementary. This is. Uh, I'm trying to get both sides' attention. Thank you, Leader. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The the Premier's assertion on coal-fired generation. It was the PCs that initiated that. Her, her, her It is a diversion because the Premier does not want to talk about the donations for the contract she shouldn't have signed. So my question is, $1.3 million to the Ontario Liberal Party from renewable energy companies. Those 30 companies are part of the $9.2 billion that we overpaid in these contracts, according to the Auditor General. The Auditor General's numbers are bang on. A reasonable person would conclude. $1.3 million to the Ontario Liberal Party, a $9.2 billion taxpayer overpayment because of those same companies. Question. My question, Mr. Speaker, is will the Premier stand here today at Queen's Park and deny those donations had nothing to do with these unacceptable contracts? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I've been very clear that uh, fundraising and uh, policy decisions are separate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, all of the parties in this House, Mr. Speaker, have, uh, have held fundraisers over the years. They have, we have all followed the same rules, Mr. Speaker, Order, and we have now moved to make changes to. Right after I say order, please, you start. So that's not very helpful. The member from Leeds Grenville will stop. Carry on. Make changes to those uh, political fundraising rules, Mr. Speaker. Um, but again, I will say to the leader of the uh, of the opposition, we took a dirty, unreliable electricity system. We have a 90% emissions-free grid, Mr. Speaker. We made. Uh, changes that led to a renewable industry, Mr. Speaker, that's created over 42,000 jobs. I say to the leader of the opposition again, it. The member from Leeds Grenville, second time. The member from uh, Chatham Kent Essex, come to order. And the member from uh, Haldeman Norfolk, come to order. And if I hear what I hear again, I'll ask you to withdraw. I say to the leader of the opposition again, is his plan to reopen the coal plants, Mr. Speaker? Final so, Mr. Speaker, I guess the $1.3 million in donations is just a coincidence. Uh, yeah. you know, since I can't get an answer on the donations, I just get diversion tactics. I'm going to ask about something uh, along the same lines on hydro. Hydro Ottawa has asked for a new Member rate from economic structure. Development the new plan would see a higher delivery fee for families that were under Ottawa's average usage. So if you conserve energy under pre this Premier's Ontario, you pay more for delivery. Paying more to deliver, yes. That is absurd, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier speak out against this plan? Why should people be punished for conserving energy? How does this make sense? How does this Liberal government condone this? Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. 
And Mr. Speaker, I will say to the uh, Leader of the uh, Opposition that uh, I assume he's talking about an application to the Ontario Energy Board where those decisions are made. Uh, I'm not going to preempt the conversation that happens at the, uh, at the OEB. And we know, Mr. Speaker, that the OEB has, uh, has accepted uh, applications for increases and has rejected applications yeah, for increases, Mr. Well Speaker. So we'll let that, let that uh, unfold. Our our job, Mr. Speaker, is to make sure we have a clean electricity system, Mr. Speaker, make sure that we put in place programs to support people so that they can, uh, they can pay their bills when there are exorbitant charges, Mr. Speaker, and to make sure that we do everything in our power to continue to support people across the province. That's our role. Answer. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question this morning is uh, for the Premier. Uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the official opposition is headed to Yes I Can Nursery School. I, I know the Premier knows Yes I Can Nursery School well because it's in her riding of Don Valley West. And the Premier was a good friend of Yes I Can, and she actually helped the nursery get funding for, for many years. It, it started as a pilot project and then moved to year to year funding all along indicating that sustainable funding was on its way. But the support disappeared, and this Liberal government has turned their back on Yes I Can Nursery School. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier explain why the Liberals turned their back on Yes I Can? If she answers quick enough, maybe Question. the Leader of the Opposition can give them an answer when he visits today. Well, first of all, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that um, I have uh, I have been to Yes I Can many times, and I have worked with the uh, the nursery school to put in place to help them to uh, to access funding. And Mr. Speaker, in fact, every year we provide uh, funding to the City of Toronto, who uh, then funds Yes I Can to the tune of three hundred thousand dollars a year, Mr. Speaker. So there is there is provincial money that goes into uh, into Yes I Can. Uh, our intention always. Carlton. with Yes I Can from the time I was Minister of Education was to help them to establish a working relationship with the City of Toronto so that they could, so that they could work with the City of Toronto Remember because that's, that's the primary relationship. What? That's how other nursery schools uh, function, Mr. Speaker, and it was always our intention that that would be the relationship. Thank you. So uh, I guess it begs the question, Mr. Speaker, what happened? The Premier what used happened? to regularly visit Yes I Can. Uh, where she worked closely with the executive director there, Janet McDougall. At the June 2011 graduation, um, she actually uh, stood up, the Premier did at Yes I Can, and she said, Yes I Can Nursery School should be the model of early childhood education in the province of Ontario, and we should fund it, she said. But now, the Minister of Education staff won't even return a call, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if the Premier believes that the program should be funded, uh -oh. then why did it take a visit from the Leader of the Official Opposition today for Yes I Can to finally get an email return? Because that's what's happened, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Brown is on his way there now, and all of a sudden Question. we get an email return. What happened? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I have worked with uh, this nursery school and, Mr. Speaker, dozens, dozens of organizations in my riding over the years, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my hope was always that Yes I Can would work with the City of Toronto and would, and would yeah. be in a relationship with the City of Toronto that would allow them to, uh, to uh, add access uh, ongoing funding, Mr. Speaker. It was never the intention that there would be direct funding from the Ministry of Education, and I can tell you I was the minister at the time, Mr. Speaker. I was working with, uh, with the Ministry of Children and Youth Services at the time, and Mr. Speaker, that was never the intention. So, I, you know, we're still trying to get the uh, Yes I Can to work with the City of Toronto to find a way so that they can get on top of the $300,000, which they already get funding for, Mr. Answer. Speaker, that they would work with the City of Toronto and establish a relationship that would allow for that funding. That Thank was you. always the intention, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks again, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps the Premier was just going around making promises everywhere that, that she can't, can't keep, but you know, the, one, the one thing is— uh, Stop the clock. Order. 
Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. There are available childcare spaces in Toronto, and yes, I can is one of the nursery schools that has space. But, Mr. Speaker, they don't have the funds to support these children. In fact, they're actually turning away three kids a week. Yes, I can has the space, but not the funding. And I read what the Premier said when she was there in 2011. She said the funding would be on the way. The years of liberal scandal, waste and mismanagement have pushed aside important programs like Yes, I Can right here in her own riding. Mr. Speaker, why should a program like Yes, I Can be forced to turn away deserving children who need a space? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, you know, um, I, uh, I think that it is, uh, it is a good idea that we look at what is actually happening in childcare in this province. Right. Yes. We, are, we are moving to create 100,000 new childcare spaces, Mr. Speaker. We're working with the sector. We're making a $500 million investment in autism because the thing about Yes, I Can is that it's a blended program, Mr. Speaker. There is an autism component to it and there's a nursery school component to it, Mr. Speaker. And I have said, as the uh, as the member opposite uh, notes, I've said it is a it's a very good model. I think it's a very good model. I think that it's something that should be looked at by other nursery schools across the province, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that all those nursery schools need to work with the municipalities. They need to have a relationship with the municipality. That's how it's work. Thanks, That's sir. how it works. We've been trying to get Yes I Can into that relationship so that they could have that sustainable funding. I Thank still you. hope that will happen, Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, last week I was in Niagara Falls where I met uh, a couple named Laura uh, and Fran. Uh, they were um, in their house. They had invited me to come and speak to them about their hydro bill speaker. Laura and Fran have seen their hydro bill increase over the last two years by more than $300. But as it happened, I arrived at their home at the very same time as the mail carrier, who happened to have their new hydro bill with him at the time. The bill was more than $600, and as much as the government wants to jeer, the fact of the matter is that put Laura into tears that morning, Speaker, because they were already struggling to be able to make their bills. Now, Laura and Fran can't afford a privatized hydro system, Speaker, where the bills keep going up. Question. Hydro costs are going up because of the privatization of Hydro One, and everyone knows it. Will this Liberal government stop any further privatization Thank you. of Hydro One? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, on this side of the House, we are very concerned that people have the support to uh, be able to pay for the things in their lives that, uh, that they need and that are, uh, that, that are uh, necessary, to their, uh, necess necessary to their quality of life, Mr. Speaker, obviously including electricity. And so that's exactly why we put in place the Ontario Energy Support Program. It's exactly why, Mr. Speaker, we took the debt retirement charge off people's bills, and it's why we're doing more. It's why we're taking the, um, the provincial portion of the H HST off people's bills, which I would remind the leader of the third party is something that she thought was a good idea, along with other people around the province. She thought that was a good idea. We are doing that, Mr. Speaker. We are also increasing support for people in rural communities. So, Mr. Sir. Speaker, we're acutely aware of needing to support people in their lives every single day, and Thank that's you. why we put these programs in place, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, later that day I was in Hamilton and I met a woman named Hannah. Hannah is a single mom. She's got two kids, and like every other mom, she wants her kids to have every opportunity. Speaker, a few years ago, her hydro bill was around 100 bucks. Her last bill was 324 dollars. Her bills are so high, Speaker, that this single mom has had to stop putting money in her son's R. ESPs. That means a tougher future for her son, Speaker. Hannah and her sons can't afford privatization and higher bills. Will this Premier stop the privatization of Hydro One? Thank you. 
Mr. Speaker, I understand that the uh, leader of the third party wants to make this false connection that she continues yeah. to make about, uh, about Hydro One and the changes that we've made at Hydro One and electricity prices. The reality is we have made significant investments in our electricity system, Mr. Speaker. We inherited a dirty, unreliable system, Mr. Speaker. We have built more than 10,000 kilometres of transmission line. We have moved to a renewable system, Mr. Speaker, 90 per cent emissions-free electricity grid, all things that I would have thought the uh, NDP would have supported, Mr. Speaker. And at the same time, we know we need to invest in infrastructure. We need to invest in transportation infrastructure. That's what the expansion of the ownership of uh, Hydro One is about, not not the linkage that the leader of the third party is making, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. The reality is consecutive conservative and liberal governments have been privatizing our electricity system, and that's why the rates are out of control. That's why the rates are out of control. That's the reality. The next day, I met another woman named Kristen, and she was in Kitchener. She had just finished university. She's got two kids, and she's paying $1,300 a month for childcare. She has $40,000 in student loans, and her most recent hydro bill was three times higher than at the same time as last year. She doesn't know what to do, Speaker. The government isn't making childcare any more affordable, but they're profiting off of her student loans, and they're pay planning to privatize even more of Hydro One, Speaker. Kristen and her husband are on the edge. Like 80 per cent of Ontarians, they don't want hydro to be sold off. They want to give their kids a great life, but it's getting harder Austria. and harder, not easier, Speaker. So will this Premier stop any further sell-off of Hydro One? Um, I actually don't know where it's coming from, but I have been hearing some whistling, and it'll stop. It's uh, not appropriate in the House. Here. Mr. Speaker, and I, I have an enormous amount of sympathy for the people that the uh, leader of the third party, Kristen and Hannah and Fran, and I think I've missed a name, but I, but I have enormous sympathy for them. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the third party, in her conversations with them, that she talked about the programs are, that are in place. I hope she talked about the Ontario Electricity Support Program. I hope she talked about the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, Mr. Speaker. I hope she let people know. Thank you, Premier. I hope she let them know that there were options. Also, the leader of the third party has mentioned post-secondary education a couple of times in terms of costs. Mr. Speaker, we are moving to make tuition free for low and low income. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I appreciate that the leader of the third party doesn't want to acknowledge Answer. that, but that is just one of the things that we're doing to help people in their lives every single day. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. The 2015 budget created a brand new tax giveaway to encourage cities to sell their local hydro utilities. And there could be more handouts coming, Speaker. To quote one media report last week, quote, Prim uh, Premier Kathleen Wynne's government will be all ears if Mayor John Tory asks for concessions to expedite the sale of Hi Toronto Hydro. To quote another, the province believes that privatizing Toronto Hydro is a good idea, and Queen's Park is interested in helping it make it happen. Now, I think Ontarians deserve to know, Speaker, whether these media reports are in fact true. Is this Premier going to give new tax breaks for the privatization of hydro utilities while at the same time families continue to pay more and more every day? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Finance is going to want to uh, speak to the, uh, the tax issue. What I will say, as I've said before, it is entirely up to the City of Toronto, their council and their mayor to decide what they want to do with Toronto Hydro, Mr. Speaker. That is, that is where the decision lies, and it is up to them to have the discussion. It is up to them to make a decision, and then, uh, and then, Mr. Speaker, to move forward. It is not up to us at the provincial level to make that decision. It is up to the city council, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, everybody knows that this premier is primed to sweeten the pot for the local utilities to be sold off, and that's the matter that I am trying to get at in this question. The Liberal government is already encouraging, Speaker, the privatization of local 
utilities like Toronto Hydro through major tax giveaways that they have already announced. And Liberal insiders are suggesting that the Premier wants to sweeten the pot sweeten the deal even more to further facilitate the sell-off of these lo local distribution companies. People in Ontario cannot afford any more privatization in our electricity system, Speaker. Will this Premier stop pushing the privatization of local distribution companies? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ultimately, as mentioned already by the Premier, the decision is up to the Mayor and the Council of the City of Toronto, as it was for the City of Hamilton, who decided to, and Horizon and other uh, LDCs decide to merge, and, and in fact, they're in the midst right now of looking at Brampton Hydro to, be, to enable greater cost savings and enable better delivery for their consumers. Consequently, the Toronto Hydro is making their decisions. It's not the province of Ontario. Uh, we have, of course, uh, indicated that transfer tax reductions occurred in the last budget from 33 percent to 22 percent, but Toronto will have to pay that tax, as will any other municipality, should they decide to go to a private investor. Should they decide to merge with other municipalities, they'll get the benefits thereof, as did Hamilton, Mr. Speaker. All we want to make certain is that the consumers of this province have the best delivery of service Answer. by their hydroelectrical service. Thank you. Final supplementary. How a finance minister, Speaker, can imagine that putting private uh, profits ahead of decent rates is going to benefit the public is beyond me, Speaker, because that's what privatization does. It puts the profits into the pockets of the shareholders instead of the interests of the people. People are having a hard time making ends meet, Speaker. Laura, Fran, Hannah, Kristen are all barely hanging on. Something has to change, Speaker, and it has to change now. Ontarians cannot afford a privatized Hydro One, and they certainly can't afford a local utility, a local hydro utility, to become a private for profit company. The Premier would like us to believe she's Member just an innocent Beaches bystander York. in all of this, but she's actually making things worse with her tax giveaway. So, will this Premier? Premier commit to stopping any further sell-off of Hydro One and not to incentivize Question. any sell-off of local distribution companies. Mr. Mr. Speaker, there's a number of things the member opposite has mentioned. Uh, one is we're not encouraging any other municipality to privatize. We are encouraging LDCs to find savings, and if they merge or if they decide to do other things, they'll get the, they'll have to pay their taxes accordingly. Uh, furthermore, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite doesn't talk about the benefits of broadening its ownership so that we can reinvest in the things that matter. In Hamilton, for example, with the LRT and other investments that are going to create even greater value in return. And of course, the province of Ontario will be the major holder of Hydro One. We will not allow any more than 10% from any other provider, any other investor, to again safeguard some of those conditions. But the member opposite makes reference to a number of other programs that are, are that she's obviously not telling her constituents that are available to them to further alleviate some of those cost pressures for their benefit, Mr. Speaker. And I hope That's the right. member opposite does explain to their constituents those benefits. And if she's not, then she's not doing her job, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Your question, the member from the PN Carleton. Uh, speaker, my question is to the President of the Treasury Board. Uh, last week, you, uh, last week, you uh, informed the House that the public accounts would be delayed. Uh, they were not tabled on the 30th of September as they were supposed to be, and I understand that the Liberal government is challenging the Auditor General's accounting methods. A Liberal told us uh, last Friday that the Treasury Board has proposed to hire outside consultants to review the books, and the Liberals want their results to stand. To me, it simply sounds like the Liberals are once again questioning the credibility of the Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, how many accounting firms is the Liberal government prepared to hire during this dispute with the Auditor General, and how, many, uh, how much money is this expected to cost with all of these extra consultants? Thank you. <clears throat> President, Treasury Board. Yes, and as, as you know, uh, Speaker, I did announce to the House last week that we would uh, be delayed in tabling the public accounts this year, which actually are due on um, the 27th, uh, 180 days after the end of the last fiscal year. And uh, clearly, we have not met that target. Uh, we are continuing to work with the uh, Auditor General to finalize the statements. Uh, in fact, uh, Minister Sousa and I did meet with the 
Auditor General, and uh, there there is one uh, rather complex uh, accounting issue that remains outstanding, and we are working to resolve that uh, with the Auditor General. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah. Speaker, I guess the question remains, what is the Liberal government hiding in yeah. these public accounts, and how many consultants are they prepared to hire, and at what cost, in order to undermine the credibility of the Auditor General? On Friday, three senior Treasury Board bureaucrats accused the Auditor General of being politically motivated. They said that, quote, they have been doing this the same way for 13 years, and she's trying to change it. My question, Mr. Speaker, were these senior bureaucrats speaking on behalf of the Treasury Board, and does the Treasury Board minister actually hold their point of view? Thank you. And, and what, I, what I can tell you and what I told you last week is that there is absolutely nothing to hide speaker. In fact, what I can tell you is that not only we will we meet this year's deficit target, we'll exceed this year's deficit target. So I'm actually very pleased. In fact, I'm anxious to get the public accounts into the public venue because I don't want the public to be concerned that there is some sort of a, a, some sort of a mystery here. We want to share the good news of our accounting because it actually means that we're on track not just to meet this year's deficit targets, but to balance our budget next year, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the, the Premier. Speaker, uh, thousands of people rallied here at Queen's Park over the weekend for decent jobs, for decent futures, for their families, for schedules you can plan a life around, and for a $15 an hour minimum wage. Thousands like Erendira Bravo, who works in construction as a contract worker when she really should be a full-time employee. Thousands who want to be able to afford their bills and pay their rent, who want to put food on the table and maybe even plan for their future. Speaker, will the Premier act on the evidence, follow the lead of Alberta and elsewhere, and increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Excuse me. Minister of Children and Youth Services, come to order. Premier. Minister of Labour. So, thank, you, right. thank you for the question to the uh, member opposite. Uh, speaker, um, I was aware of the people that came down to Queen's Park uh, over the weekend, and they're asking for us to take another look at the changing workplaces, Speaker, and what's happening out there in the world of work. And we know, Speaker, that the nature of the work in the province of Ontario is changing. It's changed since the uh, the Employment Standards Act was last looked at in the 1990s and 2000 on the Labour Relations Act, and that's why we're taking the positive step, Speaker, of putting in a changing workplaces review. We've had two advisors been travelling the province now for some time. They've been talking to organised labour. They've been talking to people about the impact that work is having on ordinary people's lives in the province of Ontario. They have an interim report out, Speaker, where they brought back the findings. They brought back some of the options that would deal with those yes, findings, Speaker. Speaker, the changing Workplaces Review is designed to address ex exactly the issues that the member is talking about. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, over the weekend, thousands of hardworking Ontarians who want to provide futures for their children yet are finding it harder than ever to get ahead don't think that a living wage should be impossible. And New Democrats don't think that a living wage should be impossible either. Will the Premier listen to Ontarians, to the workers that gathered here over the weekend, and increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thank you once again to the member for that question. Speaker, you go back and remember between 1996 and 2000, this province had days. one of the lowest minimum wages in the country, frozen. Speaker. It was frozen for that entire period of time, Speaker. It was frozen at $6.85, Speaker. We knew we could do better, and what we wanted to do was put a, a process in place that allowed for 
regular increases to the minimum wage, Speaker. And for the last few years, Speaker, we've been leading the country when it comes to the provinces in this country and the minimum wage. Alberta has moved ahead a little bit at this point in time. What we have is stability. We've got predictability. And what we'll be doing, Speaker, in 2019 is reviewing the minimum wage again. It's got a five-year review. But people in this province can rely on Answer. regular increases that are based on CPI, Speaker. That's something neither party was able to do in the past. Well, Thank you. Uh, question the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of uh, Economic Development and Growth. Minister, innovation is incredibly important to the future of Ontario's economy. We're making investments for our future. Just two weeks ago, in my riding of Trinity Spadina, IBM officially opened an innovation, innovation hub to give some of the best startup companies access to supercomputing technology wow. to help them scale up. Wow. And I understand that the Ontario government is a partner in this new venture. I have heard from many constituents about the importance of innovation activities and investments in order to help our business in Ontario propel into the global marketplace. Minister, can you help? Uh, can you please tell us more about the IBM Innovation Hub and what our government is doing to help businesses stay competitive and innovative Questions? in this global economy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Trinity Spadina for that question and for joining me a couple of weeks ago at uh, that very important launch. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, that we're very committed to homegrown innovation. That's why we invested $22.75 million from our Jobs and Prosperity Fund to help the IBM Innovation Hub get going. You know, Mr. Speaker, there's a reason we invest in companies that drive disruptive technologies. And we were at that launch together. I was at that launch together with the member a couple weeks ago. And Dino Trevisani, the president of IBM Canada, said this. And I thought it was a really important thing to say. Our job is to support businesses that outthink the limit of possibilities. I couldn't agree more, Mr. Speaker, and that's why this government continues to invest in disruptive technology, continues to ensure that our smaller companies Answer. have the capability of scaling up. And, Mr. Speaker, this new hub is an exciting new hub that's going to help us do Thank that. You. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. This is wonderful news, and it shows that Ontario is definitely focusing on helping businesses becoming a part of a fierce global competitive race. I know that IBM could have gone to other jurisdictions, but they chose to be in Ontario to take advantage of our positive business climate and our talented people. Investments like these means a lot, of, uh, means a lot to many startups and entrepreneurs in my riding, and as well as to others across the province. Can you please tell us more about this innovative innovation hub specifically, how it will support these startup the business and entrepreneurs in my writing. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, here in Ontario, we're second in North America to California when it comes to ICT companies. That's uh, that's a really important place to be, and that's the result. That didn't happen by accident. That's the result of the investments we've made in our education system. It's part of the investments we've made in nurturing our talent. Now, the IBM Innovation Hub is one example that really demonstrates our commitment to innovation, to creating jobs and building a strong economy. This hub will provide entrepreneurs and startups with the support and the advanced technologies that they need to scale up and compete globally, which is so important. It will help them move rapidly from their business plans, uh, from research to commercialization, and provide the expertise and mentoring they need to compete on a global scale. Mr. Speaker, this new investment in the IBM Innovation Hub helps to ensure that Ontario is at the forefront in leading yes, technological disruption and innovation. Mr. Speaker, we're really proud that companies like IBM are making these investments in this province and Thank what you. we're creating in the terms of building that new economy. New question. Thank, you. Member from Stormont, Douglas, Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Education. Last week, the communities across eastern Ontario were shocked to learn that their community rural schools might close after forming an integral part of the community for life for generations. Although the board has scheduled the community consultation sessions on the issue, the government cut the consultation period and removed consideration for the value of schools to the community and the local economy from the pupil accommodation review guidelines. Families are left feeling their opinions won't matter. Mr. Speaker, the Premier challenges our agri-food industry to grow to the over $30 billion it contributes to the Ontario economy. So why is the minister ignoring the basis of rural economic here, here. development? Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite uh, for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, we know that decisions around school closures are some of the hardest decisions that our local school boards have to make. And this is why our government requires school boards to consult, Mr. Speaker, to consult with communities, to consult with parents, to consult with um, those that are directly impacted by this very difficult decision. This is not just about school building, Speaker. This is about ensuring that we have enough schools, uh, enough students in schools, so that boards can make a decision what is in the best interest of students' learning and the programming options that are available to students in the best possible facility. Mr. Speaker, we have helped school boards to pursue these kinds of projects through a $750 million school consolidation fund. We know that these are difficult decisions for boards and that's why we're supporting them with an appropriate process. Supplementary. Thank you. Back to the minister. This is entirely the first time the government has deprived communities of meaningful say in decisions affecting their future. The Green Energy Act took away their right to prevent industrial wind farms and solar development if they are an unwilling host. Just over two years ago, they closed the Kempfle Agricultural College right. without local consultation. It is a trend where the cabinet thinks it knows better. Ontarians deserve not only to have a say, but to be heard and listened to when it comes to their future. Rural communities rely on local schooling in order to thrive. Pupils spend less time on buses and can max maximize their learning, extracurricular and family time. Clearly, local schools are a val are value to the community and support local jobs. Will this minister commit to ensuring that this government finally listens to the economic and community needs of rural here, here, here. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, our government has clearly shown that it's committed to ensuring that students in rural schools have an equal opportunity to excel at schools. Mr. Speaker, not only are we providing additional so funding to reflect the issues well, that are impacting times. our rural communities, but we're also, in fact, providing support for community hubs because that's an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for school space that is available to be used more broadly for needs in the community that have been identified. And Mr. Speaker, we've provided the additional supports that school boards um, need in order to do so. And unlike the party opposite, Mr. Speaker, when they were in power, that actually cut and consolidated without consultation and without input from the communities, Mr. Speaker. We're not taking any lessons from the opposition, Mr. Speaker. We're working together to ensure that our schools have the supports that they need to provide the best possible learning environment for all of our students here in Ontario. From Windsor, the country. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. As you know, the mayors of Windsor and Tecumseh declared a state of emergency last Thursday. More than an average month of rain fell in less than five hours. We had two months of rain in 15 hours. The stormwater system didn't fail, but it was overwhelmed by the amount of water in such a short period of time. Thousands of homes had flooded basements. Speaker, will the Premier commit to growing or providing provincial funding to assist some of the homeowners hardest hit with flood damage and no insurance or little or no insurance? Mr. Speaker, and uh, let me just say, I know that all of us in the uh, in the legislature were thinking about the people in uh, in Windsor over the weekend, and I uh, I made sure that I uh, our our minister was. Uh, Going on, he's on site today, Mr. Speaker, to uh, to have a tour and to uh, see what has uh, see what's happened. It's a it's a terrible situation, and I know people will be very worried, Mr. Speaker. I know that uh, the member opposite knows that there are programs in place. We've worked to make those programs more responsive to uh, people on the ground. One of the concerns that I have had is that often the money doesn't flow in a timely way, Mr. Speaker. So uh, the minister is there. He's working with the mayors, and uh, we are right there to support uh, the residents. And, and you know there there always are assessments that have to happen in terms of the uh, the municipal infrastructure and then the private damage. So yes, that's sir. the conversation that the minister is having with the mayors today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, some of the homeowners were told by their insurance companies that they now had a cap of five five thousand dollars in any claims. This news was totally unexpected. They've never been told that before. As we know, unprecedented storms are causing catastrophic damages across Ontario. Will the Premier do everything in her power to help own homeowners and municipal leaders in these situations? Thank you. Speaker, we absolutely will. And, and 
member opposite will know that um, we do. The province does assist with damage to eligible private property. The, 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 the discussion is just on you know, what's eligible, what's not, what's municipal, what's private. So that's the conversation that is happening now. But we absolutely will do everything in our power to support people in this time of, uh, of great need and, uh, and wish them all the very best because it's in these early days after uh, flooding that there is, you know, there are real emergency needs and the minister's on the ground to assess those, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Derry. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. Mr. Speaker, stable and affordable housing is one of the most important determinants in the healthy life filled with opportunity. The research is increasingly clear that access to affordable housing is vital to progress across sectors from health and education to our economy and to safe neighbourhoods. It's essential to increase investment in innovations, products and programs that tackle critical housing issues. Minister, as Ontario continues to grow, we must ensure that all our communities, including my riding of Barrie, remain affordable and accessible to the people of all income levels. Speaker, would the minister inform the House what recent investments Ontario is making in affordable housing? Thank you. Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie for that question and for her ongoing uh, commitment to helping uh, vulnerable members of society. Speaker, our government's vision is that every person has an affordable home to provide the foundation to secure employment, raise a family, and build strong communities. That's why during the summer I was pleased to announce, together with my federal counterpart, that more than $640 million in new funding wow. will be jointly invested by the federal and provincial governments over the next two years to support the housing needs of Ontarians. We've also, Speaker, committed to spending $168 million uh, in provincial funding to help build, renovate and provide affordable housing across the province. Through our renewed partnership with the federal government and joint investments in affordable housing across Ontario, we're working to ensure our most vulnerable citizens are not left behind. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. I'm glad to hear of the new investments our government is making in affordable housing. It's, well, it's needed all across this province. Mr. Speaker, Canada is one of the few developed nations that does not have a national housing strategy. I'm glad to see that the new federal government is working with the provinces and the territories to change this. I know Ontario welcomes our new federal partner and the opportunity to engage in this strategy as we have long called for. We are pleased to share the same values, have common priorities, and agree that all Canadians deserve housing that is safe and affordable. Speaker, would the minister tell the House how the government is ensuring that Ontario's affordable housing interests will be included in the national housing Question. strategy? Thank you. Minister. Well, thanks again to the uh, member for that question. Mr. Speaker, over the summer session, I had the pleasure of meeting with uh, federal, provincial, and territorial housing ministers in Victoria to begin work on a national housing strategy. During the meeting, I highlighted Ontario's priorities for a national housing strategy. Speaker, this govern government believes the, the strategy must address long-term funding, a full continuum of housing, how to align with the goals of Ontario's long-term affordable housing strategy update, and it must focus on outcomes for people rather than specific program approaches. As part of this work, Speaker, I've also hosted roundtables all across Ontario to hear what housing and municipal planners would like to see in a national housing strategy. I look forward to bringing what I've heard Answer. from these consultations to the next national meeting in November and continue to discuss Ontario's priorities. Thank you. <laughs> question, the member from Wellington, Holton Hills. My question is for the Premier. The Premier has given the Minister of the Environment a mandate to, and I quote, report back in fall 2016 on options to reform the regulatory process for permits to take water for water bottling purposes and, quote, work with the Minister of Finance on pricing options for water takings for bottled water in Ontario, end quote. Will the Premier inform the House how this will unfold? Will there be public consultations? Will interested groups and individuals be invited to make comments? 
Will municipalities be included? Will they release the recommendations before the Cabinet makes final decisions? How will the minister be able to do all this before December? And does the government plan to use this issue as a cash grab to pay for its out-of-control spending? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of uh, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is going to want to comment, but I just, I just want to uh, reiterate what I said this morning when I was asked by the media, Mr. Speaker, which is this, that I believe that it is very important to have consultation. So on the question of consultation, absolutely. We need to have input from people around the province on our most precious natural resource, which is water. And because Ontario has such a, an enormous gift of, uh, of clean water, we need, we need to be um, impeccable stewards of that water, Mr. Speaker. So we do need to have a, we do need to have a consultation. In the in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, there are some pressing issues around permits that have been extended, permits that need to be dealt with, and so um, we need to take some actions, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the in the immediate term. But does there need to be a broader Answer. conversation? Absolutely. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the mayor of the township of Centre Wellington is seeking a meeting with the Minister of the Environment to discuss their current situation regarding the Middlebrook property and Nestle Waters' interest in it. I hope the Premier will direct the minister to meet with Mayor Kelly Linton. We continue to maintain that our groundwater is essential to the future of our communities and it must be protected. We need to continue to take a science-based approach to whether or not permits are granted, taking into account the long-term growth plans of communities. Three weeks ago, on September the 12th, I tabled a private member's resolution stating my position that any increase in provincial taxes or fees for water bottling companies must be substantially shared with the municipalities in which they're located. Will the Premier commit to this House that municipalities will receive a fair share of any increases charged to the water bottling companies. Thank you. Agriculture, food, and rural affairs. Minister of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Wellington Halton Hills uh, for the supplementary. Uh, particularly this past summer, and drought conditions experienced by many of our, our farmers uh, across Ontario. We do know that water is a precious resource and we must balance the needs of all Ontarians, including consumers and farmers, when requests from businesses. Achieving this balance, Mr. Speaker, coupled with the taking climate change events into consideration, of course, is this government's goal. This is an important issue for Ontarians from every part of this province. We want to make sure that we address it by taking a rational, evidence-based approach that responds to community concerns. We're looking at this more closely from a provincial-wide perspective, and we'll be making announcements soon on the next steps. So, Mr. Speaker, I heard this from many of the participants that yes, were sir. at the International Plowing Match in the County of Wellington a few short weeks ago, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. I wish to inform the Premier that the good people of Gogama and Mitagami First Nations have reached a tipping point. On Monday, October 10th, they will be holding a protest on Highway 144. That's the road between Sudbury and Timmins. Why, Speaker? Well, because this government won't order CN to clean up the mess, to clean up the oil out of the Mackamie River from the train derailment. On Monday, Highway 144 will be a busy road with the usual truck traffic, people coming back home or from school after celebrating Thanksgiving, and it is hunting season after all, so add to this hundreds of hunters. Do the right thing right now, Premier, and order CN to clean up this ongoing environmental disaster. Question. Thank you. Premier. Minister of um, Indigenous Relations. Is he here? Minister of Indigenous Relations. He's not here. No, he's not. Minister, Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Well, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I, obviously, everyone on this side of the House appreciates the question from the member from Nickel Belt. Uh, she would know at this point that a number of us, myself included, and the current Minister of Energy and the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change and a number of MPPs on this side of the House have literally since the day the derailment took place a number of months ago, Speaker, uh, paid especially close attention to what's taking place. I know that I had the opportunity days after the derailment to be in Gogama myself, to meet with people from that community, to meet with CN and others. We on this side of the House take rail safety at all times extremely uh, in an extremely important way, Speaker. 
I have personally had conversations with my federal counterpart about the importance of making sure that whether we're talking about Northern Ontario Answer. or other parts of this province or country, that rail safety remains a priority. Speaker, we'll continue to work with the residents in this area and with CN to Thank make you. sure that we get it right. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. The Premier just said that we have to be impeccable stewards of our gift of water. But yet, since the ice came off the water this spring, I've asked this government dozens of times to come and help, but they won't. I don't get it, Speaker. It won't cost a cent to the province to order CN to clean up their mess. They are Companies on the ground, on site in Golgama, that are ready to do the work. Will the Premier do the right thing for our water today and for our water for generations to come and order CN to clean up the mess? I think so. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, thanks very much, Speaker. I want to I want to emphasize again to the member from Nickel Belt uh, that this is an issue that we on this side of the house take very, very seriously. Uh, I mentioned in the earlier answer that a number of us have had the chance to be in Golgama since the derailment, Speaker. We understand how important it is to make sure that we get this right, and of course, we understand how critical it is that people living in Golgama or in the areas around Golgama or anywhere else in the province of Ontario have access to uh, have access to safe water, Speaker. That's a fundamental principle and we understand that. So we will, on this side of the House, Speaker, continue to work with the residents, with CN. I know the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change and others on this side of the House understand how important it is that we make sure that we get it right. And I would emphasize again, from transportation's perspective in particular, Speaker, we will continue to push the message of rail safety at all times with, my, Thanks, with our federal counterparts. Thanks so much. Thank you. New question. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, our government has made a historic commitment to investing in infrastructure across this province. Through the move, Moving Ontario Forward Plan, we are committing $31.5 billion to improve the transportation transit from Cornwall to Windsor. In fact, $16 billion of that funding will go to communities outside the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area, like the eight municipality in my riding in Northumberland Quinney West. The Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, or as we call it, OSEF, has helped, has helped small and rural municipalities invest in critical infrastructure like roads and water mains. Across northeastern Ontario, 116 communities will receive a total of $58 million over the next three years to support their upgrades to critical local infrastructure. Our government has recently announced that it's providing campus casing with $2.8 million in funding for in infrastructure upgrades. Minister, can you please tell this House how OSF is Question. benefiting communities across rural and northern Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Northumberland Quinty West for his question this morning. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, we do know before the, uh, the member entered this House in 2003, uh, he was the most distinguished mayor from Brighton, Ontario. Oh, wow. And I recall wow. the member, uh, the member, of course, was a leader uh, with ABO and ROBA. And, uh, just recently, I had the opportunity to reread some of his old speeches that he made to those organizations. And what's been very consistent about his message back then, of course, was the need to continue to invest in rural infrastructure in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, just to give a little historical context, in the late 1990s, there was a committee called the Who Does What Committee, and I remember that they made their recommendations, and in this world that I was part of in those days, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Who Does What became the Who Got Done In Committee. That was municipalities because they provided no funding for infrastructure in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Who done it, Lou? Who done it? Min Minister, it's, uh, it's good to hear from the minister uh, in, inf in infrastructure in rural and northern communities to build a future that's bright for young Ontarians. I know that members opposite like to claim that we're only investing in transit in Toronto, and it's nice to see that our government is committed to helping rural communities meet their infrastructure needs. There's always more that we can do, and I know our rural municipality partners had feedback for improving the OSEF during, during the consultation 
and throughout forums like Rural Ontario Municipal Association annual conference speaker. In particular, they requested that more of the OSEF be dedicated to formula-based funding so that they had a predictable source of infrastructure money. Can the minister please explain whether rural municipalities will be receiving more formula-based funding under the OSEF as they requested? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank the honourable member for a supplementary. So I talked about his, his previous speeches. Now I can quote one from his latest speech. He said that just recently, over the next three years, we'll be investing $670 billion. That's right, $670 billion over three years in the Ontario Community Investment Fund. A lot of As the money. member mentioned, our municipal friends asked for more of that funding to be formula-based, and I'm extremely proud that we listened. We're providing more than $420 million in formula-based funding delivered to our municipal rural partners over that period. Just a couple weeks ago, our government announced that through the OCIF, Hastings County, City of Belleville, Prince Edward County will receive more than $12 million in formula funding over the next three years. Mr. Speaker, that's a record by anybody's uh, measurement. And after last week's announcement, Prince Edward County Mayor Robert Quay stated this. Answer. I'm glad to see the province devoted funds to help us revitalize our roads, uh, bridges, and other important infrastructure. It's very decent and a welcome Thank investment. You. And the Mayor Campus Casings is a good program. Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton, Portal Lakes Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On September the 19th, my Liberal colleague from Peterborough, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, was quoted in the Peterborough Examiner as saying that while he works hard trying to promote the interests of agriculture, getting others in the Ontario Liberal government to listen is a challenge. Wow. So, Mr. Speaker, wow. my question is, why is the Premier not supporting her own Minister of Agriculture? There you go. You were the Premier of the... <laughs> I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. Mr. 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 Speaker. <laughs> okay, you've had your fun. Minister. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, member from Kawartha Lakes, uh, Halbert Brock, for the question. It's a little like getting a fastball right down the middle of the plate. So I want to tell the honourable member what we're doing. This government has provided unprecedented support for the agriculture community in the province of Ontario, a sector, Mr. Speaker, that generates $36.6 billion to Ontario's GDP each and every year. Mr. Speaker, you don't achieve those kind of results without getting the support from the Premier, every member for this cabinet, and every member for this caucus to make sure that that happens each and every day. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, at 5.30 a.m. this morning, 790,000 Ontarians got up to get their jobs in this support sector, something we support every day. You see it, please? You see it, please? Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank the minister for the curveball, but really, um, the comment in the Peterborough Examiner simply confirms the disregard that this government has for our farmers and for rural Ontario. Yep. Hardworking rural Ontarians and workers in our agriculture sector are facing difficult conditions, including the crippling costs of hydro, right. the overburden of unnecessary regulations, right. and outright government intrusions into the way they do their business. But their pleas for relief and support from this government are going unanswered. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, will the Premier or the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs uh, name the members of caucus who do not support? Who, is it? who are they? Who are they? Order, please. Start the clock. Minister. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the supplementary. Not only do I hit fastballs, curveballs, and cutters, I can hit them all at any time when they throw them at me. But let me let me let me put this in context, Mr. Speaker. A number of years ago, you want to talk about support for farmers? Yes. A number of years ago, my predecessor, Carol Mitchell, brought forward a plan to provide a hundred million dollars for a risk management program for farmers in the province of Ontario. That party and that party never supported it. So when you talk about support of farmers, we have a track record. We're supporting agriculture each and every day, and we'll continue to support agriculture, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, when people in Ontario need surgery, they should be able to get it, regardless of where they live in the province. But people in my community are waiting as long as 449 days for hip or knee replacement. One of my constituents, Louise West, has been told that she will have to wait 27 months, more than two years, for knee replacement surgery, all the while paying for pain relief out of her own pocket. We are at a critical moment Speaker, if we don't cut wait times in London, more and more people will continue to suffer. When will the Premier take action to increase funding for surgeries in the London area so that people in my community are no longer forced to wait longer than anyone else in Ontario for the surgeries they need? Well, uh, uh, thank you to the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that more work needs to be done when it comes to wait times across this province, but I'm proud of the success that we've had, including in London, where in the last decade we've reduced the wait time for hip surgery by 50, 15 percent in the last decade. At the same time, we've reduced that 90th percentile, which is how we measure it, by 32 percent over the last decade uh, for knee replacement, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the budget that the uh, member opposite <laughs> voted against earlier this year invested an additional $50 million, including half a million dollars going specifically to the Southwest Lynn for wait times to continue to provide and offer those services. But Mr. Speaker, we do recognize that from time to time, and, and wait lists, wait times are based on a whole set of factors, including the prioritization that our clinicians themselves make. But I'm happy to address it more and the success that we've seen in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, wait times have gotten worse under this Liberal government, not better. People who need surgeries cannot wait months on end to be able to walk again, stand again, or live without constant pain. The wait time for knee replacement at London Health Sciences Centre is 108 days longer than this government's target wait time. People in London are suffering, and this Premier isn't doing anything to help. When will the Premier put people first for a change and cut wait times for surgery in London? Well, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, we are working with the Southwest Lynn. I know the Southwest Lynn is looking at the particular situation in uh, London as well, but I resent the implication that somehow we're focusing all our attention on other parts of the province, because when you look at actually at hip replacement, a hip and knee and around the province, uh, the, the Today, Mr. Speaker, the, the shortest wait time in the province uh, for a hip replacement is not in Toronto, as the member, I'm sure, would suggest, but it's actually at North Bay General Hospital, followed by Blue Water Health in Sarnia, Sioux Area Hospital, and then Cambridge Memorial Hospital. In fact, we have the best wait times in Canada, Mr. Speaker. We have wait times that are better than the UK better than Canada. and In fact, when you look at knee replacement surgery, we're approximately half Answer. of the average in the entire OECD. And for a hip, it's also below the OECD average and the best in Canada, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.